Good afternoon. Welcome to our lecture program. I am Kostas Janos, Vice President and Chair of the Program Committee of Hellenic Lake Midwest. First, I would like to announce our next lecture that is going to take place on Sunday, December 4 at 2 p.m. Chicago time. We will present Professor Alexander Kitroev in a talk on the history of the Greek presence in Ukraine at the lands of the broader area, which history goes back to the times of the antiquity. Professor Kitroev will join us from Athens, Greece. And because there is a time difference between Chicago and Athens of eight hours, we are going to start at 2 p.m. instead of 3 p.m. That is our usual starting time. Our speaker this afternoon is Dr. Alexander Kiru. He is professor of history and director of the program in East European and Russian Studies at Salem State University in Salem, Massachusetts. His courses cover the Balkans, Byzantium, and the Ottoman Empire. His many book chapters, general articles, and review essays focus on famine relief in Axis occupied Greece, Greek American and Balkan diasporas, Orthodox Christianity, and the origins of international humanitarianism. War and peace in Byzantium and US foreign policy in Southeastern Europe. Dr. Kiru has written many essays, commentaries, and book reviews on Greek history, Byzantine civilization, Ottoman history, and Turkish politics, as well as the Armenian and the Greek genocides. He has guest lectured at the universities Harvard, Princeton, Yale, and Oxford. He has been interviewed and quoted in several major media including the New York Times and Vanity Fair. He holds a PhD degree in East European history from Indiana University. As always, you will close the lecture with a questions and answer session. You can type your questions at any time by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. This is going to open another screen on which you can type your questions. Those who attend the event on Facebook can type their questions on the <coughs> comments box and the left or at the bottom, which is located on the left or the bottom of the screen. Professor Kiru, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Costa. Good afternoon, everybody. I would like to extend my congratulations to Hellenic Link Midwest for sustaining your invaluable annual lecture series. And I would also like to thank you for your gracious invitation to me to participate in this year's program. I would also, of course, like to acknowledge and convey my personal gratitude to Konstantin Sanos, to Savas Kokzoglu, and to Stefanos Sakelaridis for their kindness and for organizing their event, this event. I have titled my lecture, quote, The Real Ohi Day freeing the Greco-Italian War of 1940-1941 from myth and misunderstanding. My talk is organized into five parts. In the first part, I will discuss the common historical misunderstandings and distortions around Greece's role in the Second World War. Beginning in part two, I will go over the major highlights of the Italian invasion and failure in Greece, in the third section, I will review the course of the Greek counteroffensive and victory against Italy. The fourth section is dedicated to an examination of the importance and broader strategic consequences of Greece's military victory. And in the concluding fifth part of my lecture, I will present an analysis of the ideological implications of Greece's role in the war. Now, the primary purpose of my talk today is to offer a corrective, a corrective to a historical narrative, a popular myth that paradoxically gives pride of place to the role of Greece in the Second World War, but does so in a manner that obscures the true value and crucial role of Greece in the war. Why is the Ochi narrative, or more precisely, 
Why is the most inflated aspect of the Oiki narrative that we have all come to be familiar with problematic? Why does dismantling this mythology matter? It is problematic and it matters because this distorted hegemonic narrative has and continues to prevent us from accurately understanding the profound importance of Greece's real and decisive role in the war. By way of background, the first act of aggression in history perpetrated by a fascist state was carried out against Greece. This occurred 12 years before the Italian conquest of Ethiopia, 16 years before the German invasion of Poland. You see, in August 1923, 10 months after coming to power in Rome, Mussolini used the pretext of a manufactured Greek-Albanian border incident to bombard and occupy the island of Corfu, Kerkera, with some 10,000 Italian troops. After killing 20 civilians, the world's first victims of fascist war making, the Italian forces withdrew from Corfu a month after the start of their occupation. Although world opinion and Greek diplomatic magnanimity forced the Italian withdrawal and prevented Mussolini from annexing Corfu, the Italian leader's actions revealed fascism's menacing character, an ominous threat, a threat to international stability and peace that would be ignored by the Western powers until the very outbreak of the Second World War. Much as the Corfu crisis of 1923 has been largely overlooked in most histories of fascist aggression, the first major defeat suffered by fascist forces in Europe has been one of the most ignored but important events of the Second World War. Ironically, the first defeat of fascism, like the first fascist aggression, involved Greece. 19 months before the Axis setback at El Alamein, 26 months before the German disaster at Stalingrad, Greece inflicted an astonishing defeat against Mussolini's fascist empire, a humiliation from which the world's first fascist leader and first fascist state would never recover. The Greco-Italian War of 1940-1941, known to most Greeks as simply the Albanian War, would have significant strategic implications for the course of the wider gargantuan conflict throughout Europe and the Mediterranean beginning in 1939. Yet the rout of Italy's army by the Greeks in late 1940 marked more than the first major allied military victory of the war in continental Europe. For the allied war effort, the outcome of the Greek campaign constituted an important moral triumph, which would have enormous ideological consequences for the global battle of ideas between democracy on the one hand and the anti-democratic forces of fascism and totalitarianism on the other hand. Well, despite the significant consequences arising from Greece's participation in the war, Greece's role as an allied power is typically either ignored or trivialized by most Western historians. In fact, the English language writing on the war, dominated largely by British authors and uncritically reproduced by American scholars, has led to a popular distorted view of the Second World War. Inasmuch as most such works have tended to elevate Britain's role in the conflict by actually marginalizing the importance of other actors, the contributions of smaller allied co-belligerents -belliger have been largely ignored. In this sense, the historical importance and role of Greece has been perhaps more distorted than any other allied country. British national pride, <clears throat> excuse me, British national pride cherishes the myth that, quote unquote, Britain stood alone, defiantly and heroically against fascism from the fall of France in June 1940 to the Axis invasion of the Soviet Union a year later. This is a fallacy. 
This fallacy is compounded by the fiction that the British Army's victories in 1941 in Ethiopia and in North Africa represented the first supposedly significant allied victories against the Axis. Moreover, to the extent that the major extant literature acknowledges Greece's role in the war, the relevance of Greece's role is largely reduced, reduced to simply a sphere of operations that drew British involvement into the Balkans, that dispersed Commonwealth forces to Greece, and thus supposedly undermined the British from securing a decisive early victory against the Italians in North Africa. In short, most histories of the Second World War address Greece as merely a peripheral theater of operations for a failed minor British campaign, which culminated in an interesting but tangential German airborne assault against Crete. In short, the substance and analysis of Greece's participation in the war is largely ignored. And the importance of the Greek victory against fascist Italy is either omitted or trivialized in most such works. These widely recycled renditions of events are, however, entirely inconsistent with the actual historical record. First, the rhetoric of Britain standing alone against fascism ignores the many Commonwealth nations that fought alongside the British after the fall of France. This approach also omits Greece, entirely Greece, whose armed forces resisted aggression longer than any other allied country eventually conquered by the Axis. Greece, a country which fought tenaciously during seven of the 12 months in which Britain supposedly stood alone. Furthermore, the Greek army's daring reversal of the Italian invasion proved to be not only the first major allied victory of the war, well ahead of Britain's first cautious counteroffensives against the Italians in Ethiopia and North Africa, but colossal in its strategic, symbolic, and ideological importance. Finally, rather than coming to terms with and analyzing the defects of British military leadership, which produce an uninterrupted string of allied disasters during the first two years of the war, most historians have been content to repeat the hollow apologia of the British command in the Middle East during the war, which deflected its failures in North Africa by attributing them to the dispatch of supposedly badly needed resources to Greece. This well-entrenched Anglo-centric perspective has impeded the development of a more thorough understanding of Greece's participation in the war and of the seminal strategic consequences and meaning of Greece's victory against Italy in the early stages of the Second World War. As we all know, Greece entered World War II on October the 28th, 1940. That is when an Italian army launched an invasion from positions in Italian held Albania. Mussolini chose the date, October 28th, to commemorate the 18th anniversary of his ascendancy to power as Italy's prime minister. Three hours before the invasion began, Greece's premier, Ioannis Metaxas, was given an ultimatum by Italy's ambassador in Athens to surrender Greece to Italian occupation. Metaxas's immediate and resolute rejection of Mussolini's demands inspired the Greek people to popularly express their will to resist in one word. Ohi, no. The Metaxas government's immediate order for military mobilization was met by an instantaneous wave of patriotic fervor and unprecedented national unity. As Greeks, regardless of past opposition to or support for the Metaxas regime, rushed forward to defend their country against Italian aggression. The Italian invasion of Greece was motivated by Rome's, by Mussolini's strategic, political, 
and ideological calculations and objectives. Conquest of Greece was crucial to Mussolini's goal of establishing Italian hegemony in the Mediterranean and the building of a fascist, in Mussolini's imagination, revived Roman Empire. Furthermore, Mussolini, irritated by Berlin's lack of consultation with Rome before precipitating war against Poland in 1939 and invading France in 1940, as well as, by the way, harboring envy of the Germans' astonish astonishing military successes, Mussolini sought to match Hitler through a victorious unilateral campaign against Greece. Moreover, the anticipated defeat and subjugation of the Greeks was intended to demonstrate to the world the primacy of Italian fascism and the superiority of the Italian nation. The Italian invasion plan envisioned a defeat of the Greek army to be completed within two to three weeks. Greece would be invaded and occupied in three stages or phases. The first phase of operations, so it was expected, would eliminate Greek border defenses and secure the seizure of Epirus and Pyrus in the Ionian Islands. The second phase, fueled by the arrival of a large wave of reinforcements from Italy, would produce the destruction of the remaining Greek field forces in a thrust across Western Macedonia, culminating in the capture of Thessaloniki. The final phase of the invasion would involve the rapid, effortless occupation of the rest of Greece to be crowned by a triumphal march of Italian troops into Athens. Placed under the command of General Sebastiano Visconti Prasha, the more than 100,000 man Italian invasion force consisted of one armored, one alpine and six infantry divisions, plus ancillary armored artillery, black shirt, cavalry and infantry units, as well incidentally as six Albanian battalions. This force was supported by roughly 500 artillery pieces 460 planes and almost 200 tanks and tankettes. In order to quickly reinforce and nearly double the initial invasion force, six to eight additional divisions were earmarked for rapid deployment from Italy into Albania within two weeks of the commencement of hostilities. Facing this formidable concentration of men and material, the Greek forces positioned in the first line of defense along the frontier with Albania amounted to only 10,000 troops, a figure which would increase to barely 35,000 troops during the first week of fighting. The Greek army lacked any tanks and the entire air force counted fewer than 80 fully operational aircraft. Well, given the enormous disparity of forces in Italy's favor, the Italian high command was predictably optimistic about the outcome of their forthcoming campaign. Mussolini had every reason to expect success, and he was not alone. In fact, once news of the Italian invasion broke, the world press and the international community universally anticipated a quick defeat of Greece by Italy, Italy, a large, powerful country, with an enormous military, a significant industrial arsenal, a colonial empire, and a population seven to eight times that of Greece. Nonetheless, the Greek army would actually overcome these staggering disadvantages. They did so by effective concentration of force, operational deafness, and extraordinary will. In short, with stubborn determination, the Greeks outmaneuvered and outfought the Italians. All the same, during the first few days of the attack, the massed Italian forces along the border moved forward but were slowed almost immediately by the Greeks' screening units. On November 1, the Italians collided into the Greeks' main line of defense, a line of defense running from Iwomenica along near the Ionian coast to the border towns of Kalpaki and Konica in the center 
north through the Pindos Mountains and descending west of Castoria and Florina. Backed by intensive bombing sorties, the primary thrust of the Italian offensive was directed toward the city of Yanina through the vital crossroads near Calpaikia. In support of the main push towards Yanina, a deep flanking maneuver to the north and east of the Calpaki se sector was spearheaded by the Italian's elite Alpine Giulia Division. The powerful, well-equipped Giulia Division was tasked with securing control of the Pindos range and capturing the strategic town of Metsovo, thereby isolating Greek forces in Epiros from those in Macedonia and Thessaly, cutting off their supply and retreat route and encircling them for annihilation. Well, to Mussolini's horror and the world's astonishment, the Italian invasion was halted and beaten back by the Greeks. After almost a week of repeated, frenzied Italian attempts to break through the Greek lines, the Greeks had defeated the Italians in several near border engagements, including the critical Battle of Calpaki, the first Allied land victory in Europe, incidentally, a battle in which two understrength Greek regiments badly mauled and defeated two large Italian divisions and an armored formation. At the same time, the Julia division was decimated. The Julia division's intended advance across the Pindos range was harassed by constant, quick moving attacks from Greek cavalry and mountain infantry, which outmaneuvered the Italian unit, forced it to fall back toward Albania, and crushed it in a series of bold actions. The defeat of the Italian force and the steady arrival of Greek reserves enabled the Greek army's commander-in-chief, General Alexandros Papagos, to launch a counteroffensive all along the entire front on November the 14th. The main push of the Greek assault came from five divisions, which Papagos had concentrated between Castoria and Florina in Western Macedonia, that is, along a sector of the front where the Italians, waiting for the first phase of their anticipated victory in Epirus, before starting the second phase of their invasion, had remained largely inactive. Breaking through the Italians' forward defenses, and after a large-scale week-long battle against eight Italian divisions, on November 21, the Greeks captured Koritsa, Albania's then largest city. Koritsa, or if you prefer, Korce, thus became the first Axis-occupied city to be liberated by Allied forces during the Second World War, an event that, much to Mussolini's humiliation, drew enormous international press attention. The Greek victory at the Battle of Koritsa, which nearly ruptured the Italian front, had the effect of forcing the Italians to begin a headlong retreat further into Albania. By November 22, the last Italian troops had been swept entirely from Greek territory. During the next six weeks, the Greek counteroffensive pressed steadily deeper into Albania, producing an uninterrupted stream of victories as one Italian defense line after another, and as one town after another fell to the advancing Greek army. By the close of 1940, Southern Albania, corresponding roughly to the predominantly Greek populated region of Northern Epirus, had been liberated. Although the Greeks continued to make local gains by capturing strategic points along the newly established front in January and February 1941, logistical limitations forced General Papagos to halt the general advance in order to consolidate the front at the close of December 1940. In desperation, Mussolini by that time had changed his commanding generals in Albania three times and had poured enormous numbers of troops into the country all with no effect. The front may have stabilized, but the Italians could not reverse their staggering and humiliating defeat. In response to the Italian disaster, Hitler ordered the German general staff to prepare for an invasion of Greece. 
Although Hitler did not want to go to war against Greece, he saw no means of avoiding such action. Larger strategic calculations demanded for Hitler that Greece be neutralized. Hitler concluded that the success of his impending invasion of the Soviet Union would be complicated if the Axis powers southern flank in the Balkans was not secure. This was a view cemented by the arrival in Greece of a token British force in late February and in March 1941. And so, thus in April 1941, the Germans invaded and overran Greece, beginning the country's horrific ordeal of Axis occupation. Even in the midst of defeat and conquest by the Germans, the Greek army, excuse me, the Greek victory against the Italians continued to resonate among both Allied and Axis camps. Mussolini, in fact, attempted one last time to salvage fascist Italy's pride by launching a mass spring offensive, an offensive aimed at defeating the Greek army in Albania ahead of the impending German invasion. After months of rebuilding and reinforcing the Italian forces in Albania, ultimately amassing a vast armed force, an army of almost 600,000 troops, by the way, that represented the largest single field army the Italians would deploy on any front during the Second World War. Well, after having amassed this enormous field force, on March 9, Mussolini launched a carefully prepared offensive against the Greek forces, which numbered fewer than 300,000 troops. With the support of sustained aerial bombing and massive artillery barrages, tremendous waves of ground assaults were thrown against the Greek lines. Despite suffering enormous casualties, the Italian attackers did not gain an inch of territory and the vaunted spring offensive ended in total failure by March 25. Fittingly, of course, the Greeks Independence Day. Mussolini, who had arrived in Albania to observe in person the opening of the offensive, left Albania in disgust. Adding to Mussolini's humiliation, following the Germans' invasion of Greece, Greek forces surrendered only to the Germans. They refused to capitulate to the Italians. In fact, impressed, very favorably impressed by the Greeks' show of bravery and tenaciousness in combat against German forces, Hitler, half sympathizing with the Greeks, momentarily considered concluding a separate peace with Athens and considered leaving the Italian forces in Albania to fight the Greeks on their own. Well, regardless of the outcome of the German invasion, the Greek victory over Italy in the winter of 1940-1941 produced significant consequences for the course of the Second World War. But in ways rarely understood by most historians or appreciated by the public. Indeed, the standard accounts of Greece have tended to promote more misunderstanding than accurate awareness of the country's important role in the larger conflict. Much of this misunderstanding originated with British propaganda, British propaganda that was intended to mitigate the failure of, British, of the British military campaign in Greece. British apologists posited that London's decision to deploy 60,000 British and Commonwealth troops in Greece in March 1941, they posit that this decision was determinant in producing the delay of the Axis invasion of the Soviet Union by six weeks. A delay that supposedly proved fatal for the Germans because it purportedly stopped them from reaching Moscow before the arrival of the dreaded Russian winter. This argument, by the way, was happily repeated by several German generals after the war who found in the British narrative a convenient means to absolve themselves of all responsibility for their own military failures in Russia. It also provided these generals with a method to ingratiate themselves with their post-war British victors and captors. And also too, a way for these German generals to deny 
the hated Soviets any credit for their own military successes. The subsequent myth that arose from the fantastical claim that the outcome of the world war on the Eastern Front was determined, was decided by the appearance of a small hodgepodge Commonwealth force in Greece that spent most of its active time running away at breakneck speed from the advancing Germans is senseless. Furthermore, this overdone narrative is also contradictory. You see, on the one hand, British historians treat the war in Greece when it was being quote unquote fought, uh, excuse me, when it was being fought, I meant to have said, by the Greeks against Italy, it's treated as a strategic backwater. While on the other hand, when British writers focus on Britain's role in Greece, they portray it as decisive in saving the Soviet Union from what they claim would have been an otherwise inevitable defeat. Again, allow me to be clear. The British first developed and the Germans later supported this narrative for their own purposes, specifically because it covered up the extent of their failures. Not surprisingly, the British master narrative, the hegemonic narrative, was eventually embraced and revised by Greek writers who identified Greece's admirable fight in 1940, not the arrival of a British expeditionary force in the country in 1941, as the decisive, singular, determinant cause behind the ultimate Allied victory in 1945. According to this narrative adaptation, Greece's triumph against Italy in 1940 was the critical catalyst that supposedly set into motion an inexorable sequence of events that produced the access failure against the Soviet Union and thereby produced the Allied victory in Europe, a view widely popularized in Greece and the Greek diaspora. Well, Despite its understandable appeal to Greek pride, the proposition that the Greek, Greek army's victory against Italy in the mountains of Epiros set the outcome of the gargantuan struggle between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. This assertion is without substance. Moreover, this view is premised upon the uncritical assumption that were it not for merely poor timing and bad weather, the Germans would have crushed the Soviet colossus in a single swift campaign. This is a conjecture that is as fatuous as it is simplistic. Instead, the reality is that the Germans lost their war against the Soviet Union for the same reasons the Italians lost their war against Greece. What I mean here is, the fascist racism of the Germans and Italians caused them to underestimate the ability of their en enemies. And this outlook led them to plan unrealistically and inadequately for the determined resistance they believe supposedly inferior peoples, such as the Greeks and the Slavs, were incapable of mounting. In this sense, the Greco Italian War was important, not because it determined the outcome of the German-Soviet conflict, it did not, but it was important because it was the forerunner, one with remarkable parallels to the larger, lar excuse me, to the latter larger conflict. The hegemonic British-inspired and Greek revised narrative has obfuscated historians' understanding of the significance of the Greco-Italian War in two respects. One, comprehending the strategic consequences for the Mediterranean theater of war, and two, recognizing the global ideological consequences of the Greeks' victory. The preoccupation with linking Germany's defeat in the Soviet Union to Greece's success against Italy has been counterproductive to an accurate and rigorous understanding of the actual impact 
of the Greco-Italian War on the war in Europe. As a result, this fixation has promoted a false historical awareness. To be precise, although the Greek victory in Albania was not determinant to the ultimate outcome of the German-Soviet conflict, it was crucial. It was crucial to the survival and outcome of the British war effort in the Mediterranean. In short, the Greek victory against Italy contributed decisively to the failure of the Axis to vanquish Britain, not the Soviet Union, Britain. In this sense, the Greeks' victory in Albania was of particular importance because, among other things, it diverted crucial Italian land, air, and sea forces at a time when they were desperately needed in North Africa to defeat the British forces in Egypt. Thanks to the Greeks' heroic fight from October 1940 to May 1941, the Italians were forced to dispatch literally five times as many troops and supplies to Albania as they did to North Africa. The Albanian front had the first call on armor, artillery, aircraft, motor vehicles, and munitions. As a result of their Greek disaster, the Albanian front monopolized the attention of the Italian high command and remained Rome's all-consuming priority, its all-consuming concern at the expense of other theaters of operation, including and especially North Africa. Had Rome defeated and occupied Greece and not been down fighting a desperate defensive war in Albania, the Italians would have been able to concentrate all of these forces in North Africa. They would have been able to concentrate, in other words, an enormous, mobile, and far more lethal fo force in Libya with which the Axis might very well have successfully advanced to the Suez Canal in 1941 rather than ultimately failing to do so in 1942. The Greeks' victory against the Italians in 1940 arguably saved the poorly led and underperforming British forces in Egypt from defeat, a development which would have been disastrous for Britain's position in the Eastern Mediterranean. Furthermore, Italy's failure in Greece convinced Spain's fascist leader, Francisco Franco, to remain neutral in the European conflict. Conversely, had the Italians defeated the Greeks, we now know that Spain would have entered the war on the side of Hitler and Mussolini, Franco's ideological partners after all. With Spain as a member of the Axis camp, Gibraltar would have been easily overrun and the British presence in the Western Mediterranean would have been wiped out. Such simultaneous strategic losses for the British at the opposite ends of the Mediterranean, Gibraltar and Suez, would have been catastrophic for Britain, its empire, and its ability to continue the war against the Axis. So again, the hegemonic narrative that focuses on the supposed links between the Albanian war and the German-Soviet war misses and minimizes the actual and decisive impact of Greece on the larger war. In addition, in addition to the major strategic consequences produced by the Greek victory against Italy, the ideological implications were enormous. Fascist thinking had led the Italians to assume that the Greeks would be easily defeated. Once the Greek army devastated the fascist invasion force, it produced not only military panic inside the Italian high command, it produced an existential crisis within Italian state and society writ large. Mussolini was stunned, he was bewildered by the seemingly incomprehensible developments in Greece and in Albania. After all, he had carefully and deliberately singled out Greece for attack because he viewed Greece as a much weaker country. And he believed that Greeks, he believed that the Greeks were racially inferior to the Italians and therefore incapable of effective resistance. 
Indeed, shortly before the outbreak of hostilities, Mussolini was so confident of an effortless victory that he remarked, quote, if anyone makes any difficulties about beating the Greeks, I shall resign from being an Italian, end quote. Nothing damaged Mussolini's reputation and the ideology of fascism more than the Greek victory in Albania. Military morale and Italian public confidence in Mussolini's regime hit bottom, and the disaster in Greece disoriented and demoralized the Italian's fascist party. Furthermore, the Greeks shattered Mussolini's international prestige and status. Ultimately, Mussolini's position, even within the Axis camp, was marred and belittled because of the Italian defeat in Greece. Mussolini, in short, could no longer cling to his early conviction that he was the greatest of the fascist dictators, the leader of the more dynamic movement with a right to equal consultation, if not actual leadership of the Axis. Instead, from the Greek debacle onwards, Mussolini was forced to become more and more dependent on Germany, while German regard for Italian interests declined correspondingly. Indeed, Whereas Mussolini's recognition and importance as a major world leader were never in doubt before 1940, the Greek fiasco transformed Mussolini and fascist Italy into an, interna into an international laughingstock. <clears throat> I would add that one of the most important consequences of the Greek victory against Italy extended beyond the military sphere to the arena of ideas and ideology. Greece's success ended the myth of access invincibility. And even more importantly, it revealed the utter falsehood and futility of fascism. Any illusion that fascism heralded a new order, a greater civilization forthcoming, one to be based on an entirely new hierarchical idea of man, society, and nation, all of this was toppled by the Greeks' success in battle against the larger fascist, supposedly racially superior invader, the triumph of a veritable David against a modern day Goliath. Consequently, the Greeks' military victory was also seen as a moral and ideological victory for the allies and for democracy because it affirmed the noble principle that all nations, which abide by the rule of, no, of law, no matter how small or lacking they might be in might, have a right to exist and to be free to determine their own destinies in peace. Greece's defeat of fascist Italy was a defeat of the brutal idea that only powerful nations have a right to a future and that the future should be determined by force. Most historians argue that the lack of sufficient military preparedness doomed the Italian invasion to failure. Such historians miss the point. They do not grasp the fact that the cause of a lack of sufficient preparedness in Rome for war was fascism itself which like the Italian army was demolished by the Greeks on the battlefields of Epiros. Rome's fascists, you see, had been confident that Italian genius and energy were bound to bring success against the supposedly inferior Greeks. And this would be true, even if the Greeks were many times more numerous and well-armed, and of course they were not. Italians could rest assured, so Rome believed, that they would be victorious because they were more intelligent, cultured, robust, braver than other nations. Well, true to the logic of its racist nationalism, Rome welcomed war against Greece and judgment by battle as a proper test by which the superiority of the Italian nation and fascism could be demonstrated. Both Italy and fascism failed this test. In closing, let me be clear. Greece's national pride in its role in the Allied war effort to defeat the Axis 
and a celebration of the collective ohi of a small, defenseless, vulnerable country in the face of the Italian war machine, this is something to be held up as exemplary. However, what has become the hegemonic narrative around Ohi Day, that Greece's victory over the Italians delayed the start of Germany's invasion of the Soviet Union and therefore was responsible for winning the entire war? This is ill-considered and misses more critical, more critical conclusive points. That myth, paradoxically, minimizes, it diminishes the absolutely crucial ideological and strategic contribution of Greece to the Allied cause. So in closing, and I hope this rings accurate and clear, what I have been trying to do here is not debunk or reject or critique the importance of Greece in the war but to redirect our attention in a way that fully and accurately grasps and celebrates based on empirical and real historical evidence, the crucial and real role of Greece in saying that unforgettable ohi. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kiru, for this uh, very, very interesting uh, presentation of uh, the arguments towards uh, your interpretation of what happened. Uh, let me see if uh, anybody had the opportunity to put a question. I don't see any question yet. So to give them the opportunity to write their questions, let me ask uh, a question first. Do the Spanish uh, admit that uh, the defeat of the Italians by the Greeks influenced their decision not to participate in the war? There's, there's been research that's found its uh, way. I, I cannot hear you. Probably you have to. Uh, Costa, can you hear me now? Yes, now it's fine. OK, I think I sat too far away from my microphone. OK. My apologies. Yes, we, we do know for a fact that uh, Franco quite deliberately and assiduously followed the course of the Italian war against Greece in 1940 and through 1941. And uh, his decision not to enter the war was determined by the outcome of the conflict and the Greek victory against the Italians. You see uh, Franco, again, the ideological partner of the other fascist leaders, uh, Hitler and, uh, and Mussolini, uh, was prepared to go to war. His key objective was the seizure and the incorporation of Gibraltar into Spain. Spain. But when he determined that Italy's inability to defeat small, much smaller, much less powerful Greece, Italy's inability to defeat Greece, meant that Mussolini would not be able to secure his objective of then defeating the British in North Africa, and establishing, let's just call it collectively fascist hegemony across the Mediterranean, meant that the British would still be able to maintain maritime supremacy in the Mediterranean. And if the British could not be lodged from the Mediterranean, uh, Franco thought that such an action against Brit Britain, Gibraltar and operations elsewhere would have been far more uh, unsure in terms of their outcome than had Mussolini completed a swift victory over Greece. Archival research, I, I'm not a Spanish historian. I don't read Spanish. I don't follow Spanish uh, scholarship, let alone Spanish wartime history. But in the English language work on the neutral powers, including Spain in the Second World War, this has now come forward as the result of Spanish historians' research in their own national archives. So this isn't, this isn't a qualified, uh, a point of consideration. This is a, a determined and established historical fact. Thank you. So to let me go to the first question from the audience. Uh, the first question is from uh, John Pierce. He asks, you tell us that Italian morale collapsed after a relatively minor, parenthesis, in terms of military deaths, parenthesis, defeat by the Greeks. However, 
German morale never collapsed even after multiple disastrous defeats. Parenthesis, Stalingrad, etc. Close parenthesis throughout Russia. Can you comment on that? Uh, I don't see that there's necessarily a link between the collapse of Italian military morale in Albania in 1940 and the ability for the Germans to prosecute their war against the Soviet Union. The German military was not in any negative way. Its morale was not affected by operations in Greece and its operations in 1941 and the Soviet Union were defined by a, a heightened level of morale. So I, I would not link these two uh, theaters of operations together in any way whatsoever. Um, but it, what it is clear is, though, that the unexpected and humiliating defeat of the Italians at the hands of the Greeks had a devastating impact on uh, Italian um, Italian military morale. It had no impact whatsoever on the Germans. German morale remained uh, heightened throughout most of the war. The next question is from uh, Femi Anagnos. Did the Greek fighting cause the delay of operations of Operation Barbarossa? I, I think a more relevant question here is, um, why have we concluded that a delay of six weeks determined the outcome of what was humanity's largest war, the war fought between Germany and its, its allies on one side and the Soviet Union on the other. That delay did not determine the outcome of the war. Uh, German prosecution of Operation Barbarossa, even if, had been, even if it had been successful, shouldn't lead us to conclude automatically that it would have meant victory against the Soviet Union. The Germans continually, uh, tr uh, continually um, changed their operational objectives during the campaign. They didn't plan for a protracted war. The Germans grotesquely underestimated what would be necessary to prosecute a more successful war against the Soviet Union. They weren't prepared for a, a war of attrition or any length. Uh, attacking, subduing, and conquering the Soviet Union a territorial and population colossus uh, would not be uh, an undertaking similar to the invasion of Poland or France. The Germans planned unrealistically. So the timetable and the weather are completely irrelevant to the outcome of the war. The, the Germans, uh, despite the popular image that they enjoy in the West as an invincible force, were not an invincible force. They were remarkably successful in planning and executing um, uh, operations to a certain level. They were very poor planners for war. They were brilliant planners for military campaigns, but a sustained protracted war was a war that the Germans had not contemplated and were not prepared for. And that failure bore itself out in their failure to defeat the Soviet Union. Simply having captured Moscow would not have meant the end of the war. As German forces advanced onto Moscow in Operation Typhoon, the last offensive in 1941, the last part of Operation Barbarossa, rather than preparing to capitulate what the Soviet government was doing in the weeks before the Germans approached Moscow, was preparing their government, their supreme command for departure from Moscow and for establishment of headquarters elsewhere. The conquest of uh, much of European uh, Russia and Ukraine and the Baltic, former Baltic republics, and an approach toward Moscow was not a determinant in the outcome of the war. So this, this is a, a problematic conject, um, uh, conjecture. So the, the delay of the Operation Barbarossa did not determine the outcome of Operation Barbarossa. Operation Barbarossa was uh, decided by the failure of the Germans to plan properly and by the remarkable and astonishing will of the Soviets to resist the German invasion. Something that I think because of ideological perspective in the West is never taken into account when we look at this gargantuan conflict as if all the Germans are doing is fighting weather and the time clock. 
The next question is from uh, Dean Chichis. Thank you for a great and to the point enlightening historical report. Allow me please a two part question. Part one, given to the Greek victories over the Italians in Albania, what were the machinations that allowed the allies to deny the Greek portion of Albania to, the, to be returned to Greece after the end of the war? Second, what was the Metaxasi relationship to the British, French, and USA governments prior to the Albanian incursion? I'll answer these questions in reverse. With respect to Metaxasi's relationship with, let's just call it the uh, major Western powers, uh, Metaxas tried to maintain cordial relations with all great powers. He tried to maintain cordial relations uh, with every state in the Balkans, even though, of course, because of historical reasons, uh, that was very difficult, if not impossible, to do with uh, a revisionist Bulgaria, which coveted Greek Thrace and Macedonia. Uh, Metaxas had uh, a very good relationship with Yugoslavia. He tried to have a, a good functioning relationship with Romania. And he had a good relationship with the Turkish government. So much for regional powers. Uh, with respect to the larger European and North American power of the United States, the relationship with the United States was distant, but cordial. Uh, uh, much of the American media was highly critical of Metaxas as an authoritarian ruler. Nonetheless, uh, he did not have a prob problematic relationship with the Roosevelt administration. Uh, he tried to have good relations with, uh, with Germany. He tried to have good relations with, um, with Italy. He had very good relations with uh, France and Britain. Once the war broke out, however, he was very reluctant to move forward in response to British requests that that relationship become a formal alliance. Uh, in fact, it was only after Metaxas' death in January of 1941 that the uh, British were able to secure from his successor government uh, an agreement to allow British forces and air bases to be established in Greece. Metaxas rightly reasoned that if he would have opened Greece's borders to British and Commonwealth troops, that that would have provoked a German invasion. Um, in terms of the issue uh, over Vorio Epiros, uh, Northern Epiros, uh, the Greek government in exile, and then again, the returning Greek government of national unity, uh, work very hard to secure what since 1912 had been a frustrated territorial objective of the Greek state. That is the incorporation or at the least the establishment of autonomy for the Greek majority population in uh, Northern Epirus within Albania. Uh, the allied powers uh, did not take Greece's territorial ambitions into account beyond the Vodokanesian Islands, which of course were held by the Italians after 1911. Uh, the British were an impediment to Greece's uh, quite logical, rational territorial aspirations of Anusis with Cyprus, where 80% of the population was Greek. In terms of Vorio Ipero, in deference to the position of the Soviet Union and the new emerging East Bloc sphere of countries, uh, the United States and Britain uh, did not push forward Greece's territorial claims. They were largely indifferent to them. Greece also had minor strategic border territorial claims against Bulgaria. Those, those uh, claims were also ignored. So to sum it up, I would argue that Greece had tried to maintain a very good relationship with all of the major Western powers, not with the Soviet Union before the war, but those same Western powers, which benefited enormously, disproportionately so from Greece's contribution to the Allied war effort, were largely indifferent to uh, Greece's fate and the fate of Greek populations beyond the borders who sought union with Greece. The next question is from uh, Georgian Agnus. Is it true that Metaxas was conducting Hitler through a minister to discuss a peace agreement? 
Uh, that's uh, that's a, a story I'm not familiar with, so I can't answer definitively. I, I haven't read anything indicating that uh, the Methuselah regime was involved in uh, secretive uh, bilateral discussions or direct discussion between uh, Hitler and Methuselah. I'm not sure how, how that would have even been approached, and I'm not sure what kind of negotiation uh, regime uh, Methuselah could have aimed at Hitler given the fact, after all, that Rome and Berlin were, were locked in an alliance. Uh, it's very difficult to imagine uh, what kind of negotiation objective Methuselah could have put forward that Hitler would have ever begun to consider. But again, I, I don't know. Perhaps that possibility uh, exists. Uh, it's something that I haven't encountered. The next one is by Femi Anagnos. Did the German delay of Operation Barbarossa caused the failure to take Moscow in 1941? Uh, no, it did not. It might have complicated their timetable, but the Germans defeated their own timetable by continually, more than three times, uh, changing the strategic objectives that informed Barbarossa. Barbarossa changed repeatedly with the Germans uh, emphasizing a gravitational orbit and set of objectives that aimed first at destroying the Red Army along its border, uh, surrounding, destroying, eliminating as much of the Red Army, uh, battle of the frontiers, if you will. That was the first objective. Then the second objective was a move across the former Baltic states, which the Soviet Union had incorporated in the summer of 1941, across the Baltic states to target and capture Leningrad. Uh, the Germans changed their gravitational orbit by moving the emphasis from, and this was this area and this objective was assigned to uh, one of the three large invasion forces within uh, the, the German army invading the Soviet Union, Army Group North. Attention, resources, personnel were then shifted from Army Group North to Army Group South which was uh, which was responsible for invading overrunning the Ukraine. An opportunity to capture an enormous field force, some 600,000 plus Soviet troops, presented itself unexpectedly in the, la in the late stage of the summer of 1941. And so the Germans diverted most of their uh, you know, armored forces and, and incoming reinforcements to the southern frontier of Operation Barbarossa. Uh, that changed their timetable for advancing in other sectors of the front. After this massive operation that captured an enormous Soviet force around Kiev, the Germans then redirected their operational objectives, placing primary emphasis on Army Group Center, which had overrun uh, Belarusia, Minsk, and then they were assigned the goal of capturing Moscow. The Germans were inconsistent in the execution of their plan. And as I noted earlier, overarching and more important than even these continual shifts and changes of thinking and execution of planning, Germans simply were unprepared for a war against the Soviet Union. The Germans could have launched Operation Barbarossa six weeks before their intended launch date. And by the way, uh, changes of, uh, of launch dates were continual during the war. The, the Germans invaded France later than they had originally planned. Uh, these dates are not consequential. So again, my answer is this delay, whether you want to attribute it to the Greek army's victory, the arrival of the British in Greece, or a combination of the two, was not in any meaningful way consequential to the delay of the operation. And even if the delay had, uh, even if uh, the delay had not taken place, the Germans would have failed in their war against the Soviet Union because they did not prepare adequately and pro and and and, uh, and uh, properly for a long-term conflict with the Soviet Union. And that would have been the nature of the conflict as it was, regardless of the start date of the German invasion. Again, my point here is. Rather than our focus on what consequences did the Italian defeat have for the Soviet Union 
and the German failure in the Soviet Union, what we need to look at, what we need to recognize is that the Greek victory against the Italians had a direct impact on the British, not the Soviets, on the British. And that's precisely why this particular hegemonic narrative has never been questioned. And it's something that British scholars and American writers never entertain, they ignore it. Uh, this narrative is uh, one that can be historically uh, um, uh, demonstrated. And it is, it's the determinant factor in the Greek victory. It's that victory against the Italians that translates into survival of the British war effort in, in the Mediterranean. That is in strategic terms, what's consequential about the Italian victory. Excuse me, Italian. Next, the next question is from uh, George Anagnos. Why did Corazis commit suicide only one month of becoming prime minister? Uh, he, com he committed suicide, I believe. It's all a matter of conjecture. You can read into this anything you want. I think he committed suicide once he saw that the uh, defeat and uh, forthcoming occupation of Greece would be inevitable. I think he was just psychologically, emotionally, constitutionally overwhelmed by what he saw as the impending complete and total defeat of Greece by the Germans. The next question is uh, by Napsika Zotos. Have you investigated the ongoing role of Greek forces in the Middle East? Uh, I, I, I myself have not investigated the uh, reconstituted Greek forces in the Middle East. It, as you know, for having posed the question, I'm sure a complicated subject. We see in the reconstitution of the Greek forces in exile in Palestine and in Egypt, um, a kind of precursor to what becomes the civil war in its first stage during the Axis occupation of Greece, when elements within the uh, Greek forces being reconstituted in the Middle East effectively rebel against uh, British control of and influence over the Greek government in exile in Alexandria. Um, Strong anti-royalist, pro-Republican forces uh, reject what they interpret as a, a British-imposed agenda on the Greek government, well, for the benefit of the Greek government in exile, that ignored, in their view, the democratic will of uh, the majority of Greeks. This led to a crisis within the armed forces, a rebellion within the armed forces, leading subsequently to the wartime internment of approximately half of those forces who were directly or indirectly involved in protests that led to rebellion within uh, the Allied command in the Middle East. Of course, those forces that were not subject to internment were organized into uh, a very effective, albeit small, very effective operational force that fought at El Alamein, fought in Libya, fought in Tunisia, and ultimately Italy. And, uh, they became known as, uh, as a matter of honor as the Rimini Brigade, because during the last stage of um, Allied operations in Northern Italy, they captured uh, with a remarkable effectiveness the town of Rimini near the Adriatic coast. And they were also the core of the reconstitution of the Greek National Army after liberation. So theirs is a history that is complicated because of the intersection of wartime politics and uh, the very acute schism between, let's say, the Greek left and Greek right carried over from Greece into the uh, armed forces in the Middle East. Femi Anagnos uh, asks, was Japan considering invading Russia prior to December 19, uh, 19 something, because there's a question mark, did the failure to take Moscow in 1941 cause Japan to attack the U.S. instead? Uh, no, uh, J Japan made a calculated decision out of what they saw as strategic desperation to attack the United States. 
the United States for some time had been involved in effectively a campaign of economic warfare aimed at starving Imperial Japan, starving it uh, of its um, energy needs. Uh, the United States government uh, cut off, the United States government supplied, the United States supplied uh, Japan with most of its oil. It was the chief importer of oil to Japan. 80% of Japan's oil needs were met by American producers. Um, as Japan became uh, more aggressive and more militaristic in its foreign policy, it became an expansionist state. The Roosevelt government responded by effectively establishing uh, an economic blockade against Japan. And without the ability to supply itself, uh, to sustain its economy, its society, and its military, the Japanese resolved that um, that blockade, that effective uh, economic war launched by the United States against Japan could only be broken through military action and then through the swift conquest of other oil producing areas in East Asia. And, and that, um, that was the chief determinant and cause for uh, Tokyo's decision to go to war against America. The next question is from uh, Savas Koktoglu. The Greeks are divided when asked about Metaxas' role and significance in the Greco-Italian war because of the fact that he was a dictator. What is your view on this? Um, Metaxas was an authoritarian uh, leader, mm -hmm. an authoritarian dictator. Um, my view is that his was uh, an unconstitutional government, a government that had come to power through illegitimate means. Um, and before October 1940, generally an unpopular leader. However, uh, as is not uncommon, uh, in the midst of this national and existential crisis, the Axis attack against Greece, everything changed at least contemporaneously for uh, Metaxas and how he was viewed popularly. Metaxas became a kind of national hero in 1940. Uh, he was lionized. He gained considerable and popular support. So we have a, a mixed record for how the nation viewed Kastan, uh, how the nation viewed Metaxas at different times. Uh, of course, uh, after his death, once the occupation began, and decidedly, once Greece entered uh, its first phase of the Civil War, uh, the country's thinking around Metaxas was hardened and corresponded to the political factionalism between right and left in Greece that informed every aspect of society and every aspect of historical memory. Uh, I, I don't see as, um, as accurate the assertion made by some that Metaxas himself was a fascist, uh, simply by associating himself with some um, trappings outwardly of fascism, of authoritarianism, uh, I don't see in Metaxas's uh, ideology anything that we can easily or confidently label as something akin to a fascist state. So if I were to be asked to reduce in very simple terms, a characterization of Metaxas, I would treat him as a authoritarian dictator who because of his ability to rally national support in defense of Greece became in the last months of his life, a very popular dictator, but dictator nonetheless. The next question is from Vanny Kodomu. One point that has supported the position that Greece's victory against the Italians and later stiff, albeit brief, resistance against the German invasion was the need to deploy the elite German paratrooper uh, corps in Crete. The absence of these troops in Barbarossa was, as you state, 
not crucial, but nevertheless affected the outcome of the German invasion of the Soviet Union. Can you comment on this point? I'll repeat what I've said uh, several times now. Uh, the war against Greece that Germany launched in April and concluded in May of 1941 had no meaningful impact whatsoever on the outcome of the war on the Eastern Front. Uh, I didn't fully comprehend the question, but I understand that part of it I gave attention to the airborne invasion and airborne troops used in Crete in May and June of 1941. Um, the Germans deployed, uh, if memory serves, uh, one airborne division and supporting troops, along with eventually uh, one mountain and one infantry division onto Crete, then followed by other troops. Uh, th these forces numerically were completely and totally inconsequential in the gigantic theater of war that was the Eastern Front. And those troops were actually removed from Greece. Uh, Hitler, because of the acute losses he suffered among his airborne forces, uh, at no time after that in the war did he use on a large scale airborne troops for any operations. But uh, those troops were available later, and some of them were deployed uh, for operations on the Eastern Front. But again, the, even if the Germans had many more divisions on the Eastern Front that they began, then with which they began Operation Barbarossa, it's very difficult to imagine a different outcome, given the way the Germans planned so poorly for uh, the uh, war which rather than being reduced to a simple one season operation proved to be a protracted war of many years. Uh, and this, uh, not the war in Greece, is what ultimately led to the Germans' failure. And, and I would also add too the uh, incredible ability of the Red Army, despite its many losses, to continue to withstand, to fight against, and ultimately overcome the Germans. In that sense, the Soviet army provides us with a kind of parallel that we saw with the Greek army in fighting the Italians. The Germans, when they invaded the Soviet Union, had a force much larger than the Red Army forces along the frontier and in the first lines of reserve defense. I know that doesn't conform to the myth of overwhelming Soviet odds throughout the course of the war, there would be overwhelming odds later in the war. They were unprepared for a war. They were far less well-equipped than were the Germans, yet the Soviets resisted successfully. So in a sense, what we, as I suggested in my presentation, the war in Greece offers us in remarkable parallels to the war fought on a vast and colossal scale in the Soviet Union. Then uh, we have two questions from Thaimi Anagnos. The first one is, did the German late start in June 1941 contribute to the troops freezing in November 1941 and hold the Creek? Um, Blitzkrieg is a Western term. It's not a German term and it's not something that we find in German military doctrine. There's a very influential, probably the most revered scholar historian in the United States on the subject of the German military, its conduct and operations, and its military doctrine during the Second World War. And his chief emphasis, incidentally, is on the war in the Eastern Front. Uh, his name is Robert Satino. What Professor Satino tells us is that Blitzkrieg, the very word itself has its origins in the British press. Yes, it's a, it's a composite of two German words, but the Germans uh, did not use the term Blitzkrieg. What we see as lightning war in the West, the, the Germans understood in a different way altogether. Um, you know, I, I have to admit, I'm sorry, the first part of the question dealt with the delay, the matter of the delay again. 
Uh, if uh, contributed to the freezing of the troops in November 1941? Um, troops froze on the Italian, on the Albanian front in both the Greek army and the Italian army. Tragically, forces, uh, all belligerent forces during wartime experience because of prolonged exposure, uh, losses to frostbite, losses to freezing. The Germans did experience enormous losses due to frostbite and freezing, and the Soviets did too. One of the key ingredients or causes behind German losses due to exposure to the winter was a function again, and this is what I'd like to emphasize once more, it was a function of the Germans failure to even consider the possibility that they would have to fight a war that would last more than a handful of months. So again, uh, German forces froze, not because they were fighting in winter, armies fight in winter and winter takes a toll on troops. They suffered enormous casualties because of two reasons. One was, again, the failure of the Germans with their prideful arrogance and limited understanding of what they were confronting to plan properly. And the second was military directives from Berlin that insisted that German forces not withdraw at the height of their advance into the Soviet Union outside Moscow. Uh, the Soviets launched massive counteroffensives around Moscow. Hitler insisted that the German forces not withdraw anywhere. And this produced greater exposure to the German forces. They were not able to reposition themselves in places where they would enjoy uh, more protection from the, from the elements. These two things in combination, which again, uh, defy the typical Western popular depiction of the Germans as you know, brilliant, superlative, uh, highly organized German planners. This chips away at that mythology and makes clear that uh, much of the losses due to frostbite and weather were the direct fault of the Germans themselves, their planning and their, their, uh, their, their own operational orders. The second part of her question is, did the Greek general disobey orders and counterattack the Italians? Um, I'm not sure what the uh, question aims to explore. She wants to say that uh, after Papagos uh, decided that uh, they have to consolidate the front, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, somebody did not obey that and continue the fighting against the Italians. That's uh, how that, I interpret it. Uh, this depends on what period in the war we're talking about, and I'll explain what I mean by that response. There probably were, as there always are, in uh, in war. Uh, instances at the tactical or even operational level in which field commanders might take actions contrary to the orders of their more distant superiors. Does that represent a defiance of the will within the chain of command? Not necessarily, um, but we do have an instance of, uh, I think the word betrayal would probably be appropriate in which uh, one of the army generals uh, fighting in Albania disobeyed and betrayed uh, the orders of Papagos and the uh, Greek government still in Athens when he effectively capitulated to the uh, Germans. And that was, um, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, so Sokoglau. Solakoglu. 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 Uh, he had he had no authority because he only had command of a handful of di divisions, a corps commander. He had no authority to surrender the Greek army in Epios to the Germans. And he did so in defiance against the explicit orders of Papagos and the government. Uh, he would be rewarded for his betrayal by going on to become the first uh, uh, puppet governor of uh, the first uh, collaborationist government in Athens. I will take the last two questions because this is getting too long. Uh, the next question is by Dean Chichis. Although we you understand your explanation of the English historians, 
in interpreting history in their own way, why the rest of uh, the well-known historians, they are absent in responding to, that, to this, and why, and why there are no historians reinterpreting the history as correctly happened? Uh, there are some scholars who have uh, offered a contrarian point of view. There are a number of things that account for uh, the success of this hegemonic narrative. One is it was the first narrative authored by British writers after the war. It was a narrative that had gained momentum even before we see the emergence of written histories. When during the war, the British high command in the um, Middle East, the Mediterranean, Eastern Mediterranean, beginning with the commander at the time of the Albanian war, uh, the British general uh, Archibald Wavell, who was an absolute incompetent, he and his staff effectively produced the foundations for this argument that yes, we British failed to uh, stop the German advance in Greece, but that nonetheless, if not for our intervention, the Soviet Union, uh, the war in the East could have turned out very differently. So we see, in other words, an established narrative that puts this myth forward even before the end of the war. It becomes a matter of consensus among the British the British writing on the Second World War is the chief channel by which the Americans write about not just the war in Europe, but effectively defer to the English, the British, I mean to say, when writing about specifically the war in the Mediterranean and indirectly the war in Eastern Europe. Um, so that's why I use the phrase that this narrative was uncritically adopted by American authors. Um, this narrative uh, gained acceptance and popularity because it's one that served the interests of uh, British historians, British statesmen after the war. This isn't a narrative that enjoys universal acceptance. This was a narrative that was dismissed as uh, nothing more than inventive hyperbole in much of Eastern Europe and decidedly in the Soviet Union. Uh, the real question to ask here is, for me, not why is it that Western historians did not arrive at a more accurate understanding of the meaning and consequences of Greece's role in the war? In, the war? in large part, that can be answered because Western historians aren't particularly interested in the Second World War east of Germany. Uh, Americans are preoccupied with Normandy, fighting in France, and then the last months of the war in Germany. In other words, uh, spheres of war in which the Americans fought. And they defer to the British narrative beyond that point. But what's interesting for me is this, the success to which, I mean, I mean to say the extent to which this British concocted narrative gains almost uncritical uh, acceptance among Greek writers. Of course, they've revised that narrative to take the role of the triumphant, decisive actor away from the British and to give it to themselves. But I, I find it remarkable that no Greek historians of any consequence have stopped to deconstruct this mythology and then to proceed forward to ask themselves the next important question, then what was Greece's ultimate contribution and consequential contribution to the war? It's never discussed because this is widely accepted. It's what we find in the literature and it's, well, uh, self-flattering. But those who understand the war in the larger sense and are free from the kind of influence that these popular narratives have produced have come to begin to discern that like so many things about the war that haven't been questioned for the last 70 years, 
this too is being viewed at more critically. Okay, so uh, let me ask, did, did the British uh, actually fought anything of significance uh, against the Germans in Greece? I have the impression that they actually, they ran. They did not present any significant resistance. Is that no, correct? That, that, that's my conclusion as well. The, uh, Germans, okay. the Germans weren't able to, excuse me, the British, I, I cannot count one even tactical battlefield success that the British were able to inflict on, inflict on the Germans. Uh, their intervention in Greece, let's call it, uh, represents a consummate error. In fact, the British historians often identify it as the Greek blunder. But there you see, they attributed it not to any fault of their own, not to any of their shortcomings, they attribute it to a set of circumstances beyond their control. And they actually uh, attempt to lay considerable blame on the uh, Greek high command for uh, Britain's own failures in the field against the Germans. Yeah. Well, uh, with this, uh, let me see. Stefanos, do you have any question from uh, Facebook? No. No, okay. So with this, we close this lecture. Thank you very much for attending. And uh, I look forward to see you at the next lecture. So uh, we are closing it. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kiru, for this excellent lecture. Thank and you, uh, please stay for a few minutes. Okay.